the biggest risk uh, with AI may be failing to work on it and make more progress with it because it can impact uh, billions of people. Welcome uh, to Sundar Pichai. Um, some of you will remember the discussion we had last year. And in the meantime, you have moved even up, uh, not only being the CEO of uh, Google, but also being the CEO of Alphabet. So um, thank you for joining again this, um, uh, this exchange of, uh, of ideas, um, opinions. Um, but my first question is, you have called yourself a technology optimist. And we hear a lot sometimes of concerns about technologies. What makes you actually optimist? Well, first of all, Professor Schwab, uh, thank you for uh, having me here. It's a pleasure to be back. Um, what, what makes me a technology optimist? I think it's more how I got introduced to technology. Uh, growing up, I think I had to wait for a long time. I would hear about things, but I had to literally wait before I got my hands on uh, either a telephone or a television. And each thing, when it came into our household, you know, I, I discreetly remember how it changed our lives. Uh, you know, television allowed me access to world news, football and cricket, which I'm passionate about. Um, so I always had this, uh, you know, first-hand experience of how gaining access to technology changes people's lives. Later on, I was inspired by the One Laptop Per Child project, uh, this goal to, to give $100 laptops to every child. They quite didn't get there, but I think it was a very inspiring goal and made a lot of progress in the industry. And later, we were able to you know, make progress with Android. Each year, we bring hundreds of millions of people, and they get access to computing for the first time. We do this with low-cost, affordable Chromebooks. And seeing the difference it makes in people's lives, I think, I think you know, gives me great hope uh, for the path ahead. Yeah. And more recently, with AI, just, just in the last month alone, you know, we have uh, seen how AI can clearly help doctors better detect breast cancer with more accuracy. We just recently launched better rainfall prediction. Uh, over time, AI can play a role in climate change. So when you see these examples firsthand, um, you know, I'm clear-eyed about you know, the risks with technology, but the biggest risk uh, with AI may be failing to work on it and make more progress with it, because it can impact uh, billions of people. Yeah. But um, Sundar, you, you were... If I, if I look at what, what has happened in technology over the last, uh, I would even say, 30 years, there was one big uh, breakthrough. It was actually when um, AlphaGo um, uh, was beating uh, Lee Sedol. I, I think we haven't really understood yet the implications of uh, this breakthrough. And now your company, uh, Google, is again at the forefront of another um, uh, revolution, which may have even more uh, consequences, positive or negative one. It's actually uh, the, the, um, what you just announced in uh, quantum computing, the breakthrough. And I, I have to say, um, it's very difficult to understand. I just know uh, it could have a tremendous implications. Can you explain what we can expect from quantum computing? And you are now the leader. You, you have made the big breakthrough. No, it's an extraordinarily important milestone. You know, last year we achieved something, what's, what's known in the field as quantum supremacy. Uh, it is when you can take quantum computers and they can do something which classical computers cannot. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I like the way you characterized it. It's as inspiring a milestone as the deep blue moment or AlphaGo uh, playing with Lace et al. To me, you know, nature at a fundamental level uh, works in a quantum way. You know, at a subatomic level, things can exist in many different states at the same time. Classical computers work in ones and zeros. So we know that's an imperfect way uh, to simulate nature. Nature works differently. So what's exciting about quantum computing and why we are so excited about the possibilities is It'll allow us to understand the world in a deeper way. We can simulate nature better. So that means simulating molecular structures. So maybe we can 
discover better drugs, mm -hmm. understanding climate in a deeper way so that we can predict weather patterns and tackle climate change. We can design better batteries. Nitrogen fixation, which is the process by which we make the world's fertilizers, accounts for 2% of carbon emissions. And the process hasn't changed in a long time because it's very complicated. Quantum computers one day allows us the hope that we can make that process more efficient. Yeah. So it's very profound. We've all been dealing in technology with the end of Moore's law. Uh, you know, it's re really revolutionized the past 40 years, but it's leveled off. So when I look at the future and say, how do we drive improvements, quantum would be one of the tools in our arsenal uh, by which we can keep something like Moore's law continuing to evolve. So the potential is huge, and you know, we'll have challenges. Yeah. You know, in a five to 10 year time frame, quantum computing will break encryption as we know it today. But you know, we, can, we can work around it. We need to do quantum encryption. Uh, so there are challenges, as always, with any evolving technology. But I think the combination of AI and quantum will help us tackle some of the biggest problems we see. And you add also, to a certain extent, genetics. I mean, I think uh, quantum computing and biology will... One of the uh, biggest potential. Will, ...will have a great potential. Yeah. Positive and negative one. Uh, the positive one, as you're saying rightly, is, uh, you know, to simulate molecules, protein folding, yeah. et cetera, to, it's yeah. very, very complex today. We cannot do it with classical computers. So with quantum computers, yeah. we can. Yeah. Uh, but we have to be clear-eyed about, uh, you know, all these powerful technologies. And, uh, you know, this is why, you know, I think we need to be deliberate and regulate uh, uh, technologies like AI and as a society needs yeah. to need to engage on it. But that leads me to the next question, actually, because um, in an editorial in Financial Times, which I read just before the annual meeting, you stated, and I quote, Google's role starts with recognizing the need for a principled and regulated approach for applying artificial intelligence. What, what, what does it really mean? You know, I, I've said this before, AI is one of the most profound things we are working on humanity, uh, as humanity. It's more profound than fire or electricity or any of the other bigger things we have worked on. Uh, it has tremendous positive sides to it. But you know, it has real negative consequences. You know, when you think about uh, technologies like facial recognition, it can be used to benefit. It can be used to find missing people, but it can be used for mass surveillance. Mm -hmm. And as, as democratic countries with a shared set of values, we need to you know, build on those values and make sure when we approach AI, we are doing it in a way that serves society. And that means making sure AI doesn't have bias that we build and test it for safety. We make sure that there is human agency, that it's ultimately accountable to people. In about 18 months ago, we published a set of principles mm -hmm. under which we would develop AI as Google. Mm -hmm. But it's been very encouraging to see the European Commission has identified AI and sustainability as their you know, top priorities. Mm -hmm. And it's in, US put out a set of principles last week and be it the OECD or G20, they're talking about this, which I think is very, very encouraging. And I think we need a common framework by which we approach AI. Are you, are you satisfied with those frameworks you said, which have been developed until now? I mean, you refer to the OECD framework, G20 framework. It's an early start. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm very encouraged that they are, they have a lot of commonality and that's because they are rooted in common yeah. human values. So I think it's a great start, but we need to get more specific and, and evolve it significantly. Uh, I think the European Commission is working on yeah. uh, you know, a white paper yeah. around AI, and uh, I think that's an important first step, and we all need to engage. As a company, we are committed to engaging in the process, but it's gonna need everyone from around the world. AI is no different from climate. You, know, no. you can't get safety by just having one country or a set of countries. Uh, working on it. You know, you need a global framework uh, to arrive at a safer world there. But Sunda, you, you emphasize a global framework now. Um, the question is, how much is actually China engaged into those efforts? And don't you see the danger of the two uh, circles and um, that at the end 
we end up with two different frameworks. One which is more uh, coming out of Beijing and one which is developed uh, inside the OECD um, uh, concept. Um, you know, I think there is, uh, there is concern that we could, you know, uh, bifurcate here, uh, but I think it's important not to do so. I'm optimistic because just like in climate, I think there's more alignment. You know, we have things like the Paris Agreement. The world comes together because everyone shares uh, the climate uh, in which the Earth, uh, you know, how it affects the Earth. And so I think that's true for AI. So down the line, I think there'll be, there'll be a common gravitational pull, uh, regardless of who you are, to try and converge. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to achieve peace and prosperity. So I think there'll be a, uh, there'll be a gravitational pull. No, we need it. And we actually, it. the forum with its center for the fourth industrial revolution is trying uh, to, to bring the parties together. Now, I, I, I changed for a moment the subject. And uh, when you look at the GDPR, the California Data Privacy Act, um, regulators start to take meaningful action. Uh, to protect consumer privacy and address, uh, I mean, it's a second issue, the, the growing anti -concer antitrust concerns, um, Google buying up all startups which are in the, uh, let's say, AI area and so on. Um, and some believe uh, that uh, actually companies like Google should pay, I think it was called, a digital dividend. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you can you uh, exp uh, um, share with us what what is actually is the policy of of Google and I have here two and I, I come back privacy and antitrust. You know, it's a it's a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe we'll talk about privacy. You know, uh, GDPR has been a great uh, great uh, 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 template. Um, I think it gives a standardized privacy framework, uh, you know, and often when we are in other countries and when we are, they are thinking about privacy regulation, you know, we point to GDPR as a template. I'm glad Europe took the lead on it. And I think that gives a good framework for all of us to work on. Um, for us, you know, privacy is at the heart of what we do. You know, users come to Google at very important moments, ask us questions. We deal with people's sensitive information in Gmail, Google Photos, and so on. And so we have to earn that trust. And you know, today we do it by giving them control and transparency and choice around it. Mm -hmm. And over time, I think AI actually allows us to do this better. We can do more for our users. Most of the data today we deal with is to help users with their information needs. And we can do that with less data over time. Um, and it's counterintuitive. But last year, for example, if you use Google's keyboard, we actually now learn uh, what to suggest but we don't send the raw data back. We only compute our models and the data stays on the phones. So over time, I think we can do more things on device. We can use AI to actually preserve privacy as we improve user experiences. And I do think it should be, it's important that products need to work for everyone. It's a foundational principle. So today, if you take a product like YouTube, we allow users to pay for it and get it in an ad-free basis, or you have an ad-supported product. It's what allows us to take information and provide many services to billions of people around the world. And you know, privacy cannot be a luxury good. We That's need to so. make sure we develop services in a way that works for everyone, but puts them first and you know, is privacy enhancing. And, and that's the journey we are all on. But ultimately, it's up to users to choose. On your second question, I think with our scale, uh, rightfully comes scrutiny. You're right, we have bought startups, but you know, as a company, we invest every single year in hundreds of startups through our venture arms. We support entrepreneurs and incubators around the world. Uh, you know, through our Grow with Google program, we are trying to digitally skill millions of people. In Europe alone, we have skilled over 5 million Europeans. So with scale comes the chance to work on things, take a long-term view on important technologies like AI and quantum computing. And so, you know, that it gives us a chance to do that. But ultimately, you know, we have to do it all in a way that works for society. 
that's the real test. And society has to judge whether what we are doing is beneficial. And you know, we want to engage constructively in the process, and 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 you know, and earn our right to do that. But we aren't do, you know, we aren't building up scale for scale's sake. You know, we are trying to do important things for our users. I'm sure. Uh, let, let's integrate the audience for a moment. And we don't, even if you don't have a microphone, just speak loud. Uh, I'm sure there might be a follow-up, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, please, yeah. Let's see uh, any anybody who... To, and we, we stick to the question of privacy or antitrust, please, at the moment. Do you want? Sure. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Sundar. I'm, my name is Samar Sekka. I'm from the Global Shapers community from India. Um, first of all, I'm a huge admirer and a tech enthusiast myself. I wanted to ask you, uh, India is in right now, it's a huge market for you. Your program on the next billion users is aimed at India. Uh, India is right now in the middle of a data protection bill, um, which has seen a lot of changes over the last year. It was first seen as very restrictive to global multinationals like Google and, uh, and other big tech companies. Now that it is being debated, India, the, the government has eased some of those regu regulations. At either of these points, Google has not actively lobbied or fought this bill. They have said that we will comply with what the government says. What is your view on it? Because you're one of the few CEOs, unlike I think many of your counterparts, who takes a balanced view saying that there are risks, but there are also benefits. People generally come out, CEOs generally come out on either end of that spectrum. Uh, what would you like to see come out of the data protection bill where the next billion users in India could uh, could benefit, but Google could also sort of you know take uh, move towards its vision? I, I would um, just enlarge your question and not yeah, relate it to India, but to what? Uh, so the question would be, uh, if, if you would design, from your point of view, an ideal uh, data protection bill, how would it look like? You know, it's a great question. We are in the World Economic Forum. We bring people together. That's what the internet is all about. You know, the value of internet comes in connecting the world. And to do that, you need a free, open internet to work. At the same time, and you know, I see it's not just in India, as Professor Schwab mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's a big, uh, big topic in Europe and all other countries around the world. Politicians, rightfully, you know, they are charged with protecting their citizens. And, and as part of that, you know, data sovereignty is an important topic as well. But it is inherently a balance, right? And I think you need to, I think countries need to focus on the highest risk areas and maybe add productions around it. But you want to uh, you know, help preserve a common internet. Even in India, for example, if you take a product like YouTube, many creators in India, more than 50% of their views come from outside of India. The internet is essentially an export product. You, know, you can build a service regardless of where you build it you can reach people around the world. That's what's great about the digital economy. It's, uh, it creates new opportunities. And so that's the balance countries have to strike. But I think, you know, uh, you know, I think there are good regulations. GDPR is a good framework as we think about how you can protect privacy for, our, for, for your users, for your citizens. Doesn't always mean data has to be siloed in a particular way. And I think, I think we need to evolve those frameworks carefully. Any other comments? Um, let me see. Uh, Maybe no, someone let's from go, behind. Let's yeah. go in the back. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a... Hello, my name is Kwan from uh, Learnable AI. Actually, uh, AI startup from Harvard Innovation Lab. So we do a lot of uh, explainable AI. So, and uh, I'm a big fan of Google's technology, especially DeepMind. Uh, so I want to know, in terms of transparency and explainability for uh, AI, what do Google think and what's Google's plan? Thank you. Such a great question. Uh, you know, one of our AI principles is that AI is ultimately accountable to humans, and, and to do that, well, explainability is a big part of it. Now, you can imagine a self-driving car making a decision and us being able to explain. I think it's worth remembering humans can't always explain how we make our decisions. We <laughs> think we can, uh, and we say some things, but you know, that's not how it really happens. So I think it's worth remembering that. But we are building, it's one of our most active areas of research. For example, to counter AI bias, you know, last year we published research. So for example, if you have an image recognition algorithm and it predicts and says these are doctors, we can now say what are the variables you're using to predict that these images are doctors. It may say white coats, that makes sense. 
but sometimes the model can say male because it has seen only pictures of male doctors. And then you know it's not working well. That's an example of explainability which we do. And you know, we are working hard to drive that. But it is an area of research. But I think it's an important principle to do that before we use AI in high-risk applications. And, uh, but it's exciting as well. AI actually gives us a chance to do some things where humans are actually biased and we reinforce our bias to understand that, counter it, and do it in a better way as well. So we need to invest to get there. Yeah. Let me take one other. Um, so. Hello, uh, I'm Claudio Leverance, also from the Global Shapers community. And I wanted to know your thoughts about data privacy and health-related data. What do you think uh, is the direction that Google will, will lead um, the health data in? You know, the good thing about the healthcare sector, uh, you know, is that there are already strong regulations in place. You know, as we think about regulating AI, I think it's important to leverage regulations where they exist. And healthcare has good privacy protecting regulations in place. As Google, we see a huge opportunity in healthcare. But when we work on healthcare, uh, when we work with hospitals, the data belongs to hospitals, right? And that's how we approach it. Uh, where we can, we encrypt the data, and the hospitals would have the key for it. But look at the potential here. When we look at an area like radiology, when we, people, you know, there are often times cancer gets missed, and, and the difference in outcomes is profound. When you take an area like lung cancer and you show the pathology results to experts, very often, if you show it to 10 experts, five people agree one way, five people agree the other way. We know we can use AI to make it better. And so I think it's important we do that. But I think these are areas in which you have to do it with privacy in mind. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged that there is strong privacy protecting regulation already in place, which gives us a framework to do it well. But I think healthcare offers the biggest potential, I think, over the next five to 10 years to really improve outcomes, and so we are committed to doing that. The forum is working uh, together with the Japanese government uh, to address this issue, to find the right balance between mm -hmm. privacy and access to the data. Um, uh, now, if I look at Apple, and um, particularly also your transition from, uh, at, uh, at Google and your transition from um, now from Google to Alphabet, you are involved in so many different areas. I mean, Waymo, Sidewalk, and so on and so on. Um, what, how do you see the future of the company? Is it a giant uh, which uh, sucks up everything? Or um, how do you see Google in five years from now? <laughs> Look, we, we know we will do well only if others do well along with us. You know, that's how Google works. Today, through search, we help users reach information they want, including businesses, and businesses grow along with search. In the US alone last year, you know, we created $335 billion of economic opportunity, and that's true in every country around the world. We think with Alphabet there is a real chance to take a long-term view and, and work on technology we can, which can improve people's lives. But we won't do it alone. In many of the other bets which we are working on, uh, where we can, we take outside investments. Yeah. Um, these companies are independent. So you can imagine we'll do it in partnerships with the other companies. And, and, and Alphabet gives us the flexibility to have different structures for different areas in the way we need them to. Mm. If it's healthcare, we can deeply partner with other companies. Today, we partner with the leading healthcare companies as we work on these efforts. So this is, we understand for Alphabet to do well, we inherently need to do it in a way that works with other companies, creates an ecosystem around it. This is why last year, just through our venture arm, we invested in over 100 companies. We are just investors in these companies, and they're going to be independent companies. We want them to thrive and succeed. And so uh, you know, that's the way we think about it. But I think it gives us a real chance to take a long-term view, be it self-driving cars or AI, and approach it uh, with a long-term view in mind. So now I have one last question. You, you are uh, now um, at the top of 
one, one of the three or four, whatever you say, um, not only most valuable companies, but most powerful companies. Um, you said you are an optimist. Um, when you wake up at night, what, <laughs> and you cannot sleep anymore, what worries you at that time? <laughs> uh, you were pretty insightful. When you wake up at night, that, that is literally <laughs> true. Yeah, I do, I, do, I do wake up at night. Um, you know, and um, what worries me at night, uh, you know, I, I, I think technology has a chance to transform, uh, uh, you know, society for the good, but we need to learn to harness it to work for society's good. But I do worry that we turn our backs on technology. And I worry that, you know, when people do that, they get left behind too. And so to me, how do you do it in an inclusive way? You know, just coming here, I was in Belgium and I went to Molengeek. You know, it's a, it's a startup incubator in Molenbeek. In that community, you see people who may not have gone to school, but when you give them access to digital skills, they're so hungry for it. Yeah. People want to learn technology and be a part of it. Yeah. That's the desire you see around the world when we travel, when I go to emerging markets. You know, it's a big source of opportunity. And so I think it's our duty and responsibility to drive this growth in an inclusive way. And so that keeps me up at night. If you're translated in the, in the political field, uh, I think what the, the transition we have had is in the first industrial revolution, we created new ideologies like Marxism, mm -hmm. uh, socialism, and capitalism. Today, I think the dividing line in the society is between those who embrace technology and those who reject uh, technology. So um, you have also an, an important role as a, a prophet or missionary uh, to explain that uh, all those new technologies at the end are beneficial for humankind? You know, very much so. Uh, search at the heart works. It does not matter whether you're a student in Africa or you're a professor at Stanford. You know, search works the same way as long as you have access yeah. to a computer and connectivity. You know, that's an equalizing force. And, you know, then that's how we need to appro approach technology over time. And I think that's the real opportunity we have. So you don't have to if I, I, I take your role, you, you don't have to sell only a product or manage your, I don't know how many people now, um, but you have to be at the out front to explain continuously that what you are doing is good. Now, how much time do you devote to the third portion of your responsibility? You know, I think with naturally, uh, with scale comes that responsibility. I do see as a big role for us to engage externally, you know, partner with other institutions, be it governments, regulators, nonprofits, uh, educational institutions. The Forum. Uh, the World Economic <laughs> Forum, and, and, and engage. And I think it's yeah. a big part of what we do. Uh, yeah. so. No, thank you very much uh, to, to have responded to those sometimes critical questions. And um, uh, we hope we said we can continue this discussion in the coming years. And we wish you all the best in the meantime. And we all will use Google substantially in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>